If you want to turn to Ezekiel chapter 22, that is where we will get started together this morning. Ezekiel, the 22nd chapter. And once you find Ezekiel chapter 22, place a marker in Psalm 106. We will be there shortly after. Ezekiel 22, Psalm 106. It's about 597 B.C., and you are living in Babylon. You've been stripped from your home, stripped from your job, stripped from your friends, stripped from your family, stripped away from everything that makes you, you. And you've been forced. You've been forced to learn a new and entirely different way of life. New laws, new customs, new language. You've been given a new name. Everything is different and absolutely nothing is the same. All of your life, you had high hopes, dreams, and aspirations of serving as a priest in the beautiful city of Jerusalem, but now you are a slave. Now you are in exile. Now you are in Babylon. And as you stand beside the exiles, beside the river Chabar, you begin to think to yourself, how in the world did I get to this point? How in the world did I and my nation get to this point? How in the world did the once beautiful, lovely, beloved city of Jerusalem end up scattered with dead bodies, bones, and ashes? You think to yourself. You think, you think, and you think. And then it comes to you. You realize that Your beautiful city is lying in ruins because it's all your fault. You recognize that when your people lived for Belial, when they turned their hearts away from the Lord, when they were physically, politically, and morally corrupt, you sat back and you did absolutely nothing. And so God did something. In Ezekiel chapter 22, the Bible says in verse number 29, Ezekiel 22 and verse 29, that the people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I, the Lord speaking, I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land so that I should not destroy it, but I found none. God's people had turned their backs on Him. God's people were immoral. God's people were godless. God's people were faithless. They were morally, physically, and politically corrupt. God looked at the nation. He was upset. His heart was upset. The Lord was so mad that He was about to completely and totally wipe His people out. But before He did, before He did, He looked upon the nation. He looked upon the nation. He tried to find just one man. He sought for a man who would stand in the gap. He sought for a man who would come up to Him and say, Hey Lord, Lord, please have mercy on us. Please be patient with us. Give us some time so that we can get our lives together. He sought for a man, but sadly, he found none. And so the text says in verse 31, Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their way upon their heads, declares the Lord. Pretend just for a moment that you are in Babylon. You are a slave. You are in exile. You have been stripped away from everything that makes you, you. And your once beautiful, beloved city of Jerusalem is now scattered with dead bodies, bones, and ashes. 
all because you did not act. I enjoy preaching textual sermons. I like to look at a passage of Scripture and allow the passage to make the points. It would be a wonderful thing if I could preach a textual sermon from Ezekiel chapter 22 this morning and show you exactly what it looks like for a man to stand in the gap. It would be a wonderful thing if I could preach a textual sermon from Ezekiel chapter 22 to show you what it looks like for a man to say, Lord, Lord, please be patient with us. Let me help my people get better. I would love to do that this morning, but sadly, I can't. This morning, I cannot show you what it looks like from Ezekiel chapter 22 for a man to stand in the gap. And so we're going to have to go to Psalm 106. Thankfully, there is Psalm 106. In Psalm 106, we see exactly what it looks like for a man to stand in the gap. In Psalm 106, we have the events of the children of Israel shortly after Moses delivered them from Egyptian bondage. And we learn the children of Israel, just like the Children of Israel during the days of Ezekiel had turned their backs on the Lord. They had begun worshiping idols. The text says in Psalm 106 verse 19 that the people made a calf in Horeb and worshiped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God their Savior who had done great things in Egypt, wonderful works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the sea. God's people had turned their backs on him, and the text says in verse 23, Therefore he, God, said that he would destroy them. Just like he was set to destroy his people during the days of Ezekiel, God was set to destroy his people during the days of Moses. However, the text says, God was set to destroy them had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the gap before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. Ezekiel chapter 22, the Lord sought for such a man, but he found none. But thanks be to God, here in Psalm 106, we have a perfect example of Moses, a man who stood in the gap. And so, the next question that we have to consider this morning is, what does that look like? What does it look like for a man to stand in the gap? We know that Moses did it. What did he do? In order to find out what Moses did, we're going to have to turn a few pages to the left to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9 is another account that tells us about the events that took place shortly after Moses delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. We know that Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law from God, and the children of Israel were down in the valley making idols. And the Lord, just as He was during the days of the children of Israel, uh, during the time of Ezekiel, the Lord was upset. He was furious. He was about to wipe them out then, and He is upset to do the same now. And so the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 9, starting in verse number 11, at the end of the 40 days and the 40 nights, the Lord gave me, Moses speaking, the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you have brought from Egypt have acted corruptly. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I have commanded them. They have made themselves a metal image. Furthermore, verse 13, the Lord said to me, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stubborn people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. God is about to wipe them out. God is about to blot them out. God is about to start all over again, but we learned in Psalm 106 that Moses stood in the gap. What does that look like? What does that mean? That means that Moses, when he learned that his Lord was about to punish his people, called out their sins. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, starting in verse number 15, Moses says, 
So, so I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain was burning with fire. And the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So, verse 17, so I took hold of the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. Here in this passage, when the Lord was so furious, he was so enraged, he was so upset that he was about to punish his people and wipe them out and blot them out over the face of the earth, Moses stood in the gap. And the first thing that he did was call out the nation's sin. When Moses learned that the people were down in the valley making idols, he did not ignore it. He did not turn a blind eye to it. He did not join in on the sin. He didn't worship the idol with the people. He didn't preach some shallow, watered-down message. No, he called out their sins. He let them know that they had done wrong. They had turned their backs on the Lord, and the Lord was set to punish them and wipe them out. And I love the analogy that we have here in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. Moses takes the law, he takes the tablets of stone, and he breaks the tablets of stone before all of the people. It's almost as though Moses breaking the physical tablets of stone was a sign to the people that they had broken the spiritual law of God. Moses made it very clear that the people had transgressed the will of God when they were living in sin. Moses was a man who stood in the gap. He stood in the gap by calling out the nation's sins, and he stood in the gap by praying and fasting. As the story continues, the text says in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse number 18, Moses speaking, Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, forty days and forty nights, I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all of the sin that you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure of the Lord who bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. And the Lord was so angry with Aaron that he was ready to destroy him And I prayed for Aaron also at that same time. Here we see when Moses realized that his people had turned their backs on God, we see when the Lord was about to blot the people out from the face of the earth, Moses fell down on his face, he fasted, and he prayed to the Lord. He spent some time with God. He had just a little talk with the Lord. He told the Lord that he was sorry for the nation's sins. He told the Lord that his people would do better. Moses felt sorry for his people. He loved his people. He had so much compassion and care for his people that he fell down on his face and he prayed to God for his people. Moses. Moses was a man who was a leader. Moses was a man who was a servant. Moses was a man who stood in the gap when God was about to wipe the nation out. He stood in the gap by calling out the nation's sins. He stood in the gap by praying and fasting. And he stood in the gap by getting rid of the problem. The text continues to say in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse number 21. After Moses prays to the Lord, he continues to say in verse 21 that he took the sinful thing. I took the sinful thing the calf that you had made and burned it with fire and crushed it, grinding it very small until it was as fine as dust. And I threw the dust of it into the brook that ran down the mountain. Moses takes the sinful thing. He takes the idol. He takes the golden calf and he destroys it. He grinds it as fine as dust, and we learn that he also makes the people drink it. In Exodus chapter 32, in Exodus chapter 32, we have a little more insight into what happened on this day when Moses got rid of the problem. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse number 20, that Moses took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire 
and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. He literally and he physically got rid of the problem. And what is so impressive and what is so fascinating is not only did Moses destroy the golden calf, but Moses got rid of the people who had encouraged the nation to worship the idols. The text continues to say in Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse number 25. Exodus chapter 32, verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. Not only did Moses get rid of the idol, but Moses got rid of all of the people who encouraged the nation to worship the idols. Who is on the Lord's side, he says. Stand over here. If you weren't on the Lord's side, Moses encouraged you to kill your neighbor, kill your brother, kill your friend, kill whoever it may be who is not on the Lord's side because Moses was a man who was determined to get the sin out of the camp. He was a man who was determined to get rid of the problem. This morning, this morning we are considering how Moses stood in the gap. We're considering what Moses did, what exactly Moses did to persuade the Lord not to wipe the nation of Israel out. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and here in Exodus chapter 32, we learn that Moses was able to persuade God not to blot the nation out by calling out the people's sins, by praying and fasting, and by getting rid of the problem. Today is April the 10th, 2022. And thankfully, we are not there yet. Things could have been so different in Ezekiel chapter 22. Things could have been so different in Ezekiel chapter 22 had the Lord found just one man. Had He found just one man who was willing to stand in the gap. But sadly, because He couldn't find such a man, the city was scattered with dead bodies, bones, and ashes. Thankfully, we're not there yet. God hasn't punished us yet. God has continued to bless us with time. But friends, we all know there is going to come a day when the Lord's patience will run out. There is going to come a day when this world will be burned up and destroyed and we will have no more time. Many of us have friends. Many of us have family members. Many of us have neighbors. Many of us have co-workers who we love so much. But these friends, family members, neighbors, and co-workers may not be right with the Lord. And so while the Lord has blessed us with time, May we use it to stand in the gap. While the Lord has blessed us with time, may we use it to, just like Moses, call out sin. We should not ignore sin. We should not join in on sin. We should not take sin lightly. When we see sin, we should call it out. Moses called out the nation's sin. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. That is our responsibility. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 20, the Apostle Paul encourages the young evangelist Timothy to rebuke those sharply in the presence of all who continue in sin. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul encourages the young evangelist to preach the Word. And he tells the, the young evangelist that the Word of God is to reprove and to rebuke. That is the purpose of God's Word. The purpose of God's Word, or one of the purposes of God's Word, is to call out sin. No, we are not perfect. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And when we call out sin, yes, we want to examine our hearts and do so in a spirit of love and gentleness. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. And yes, before we call out the sin of someone else, we want to examine the plank in our own eye before we examine the speck in our brother's eye. Matthew chapter 7. But we as children of God have a responsibility to call out sin. We need people who are like John the Baptist. In Mark chapter 6, John the Baptist called out Herod's sins. This woman that you are with is not your wife. John could not care less about the consequences. We learn that John the Baptist lost his head because he was a man who was boldly and courageously willing to call out the king's sin. That is the type of mindset and that is the type of attitude that we need from God's people. We need men like Stephen, who in Acts chapter 7 was contending with the Jewish religious leaders. Stephen lost his life for calling the Jewish religious leaders stiff-necked people who were uncircumcised in hearts and in ears. Stephen was a man who called out the nation's sin, and he ultimately lost his life for it. But we know that Stephen, as well as John the Baptist, are likely with the Lord. They're likely with the Lord for all of eternity because they were men who were faithful servants of God. As we live in this world that is full of sin and temptation and challenges, we should be people who are willing and who are courageous and bold to call out sin. But not only that, while the Lord has blessed us with time, we must be people who, like Moses, are willing to pray and who are willing to fast. And when I talk about fasting, I'm not only saying go a day or go two days or 40 days without eating. That's not what I'm saying. When I talk about fasting, I'm saying rid yourself of worldly concerns and spend some time with God praying on behalf of your friend, your family member, your neighbor, or your coworker who is suffering in sin. Take some time with God. Love people to the degree that you are willing to talk to God on behalf of them. These are the type of things that we must do if we expect this world to turn its hearts and its minds away from Satan and draw closer to the Lord. While God has blessed us with time, may we call out sin, may we pray and fast, and may we be people who are willing to get rid of the problem. Moses physically got rid of the problem, and as Christians we have Example after example after example in Scripture of how God expects His children to get rid of the problem. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we have an example of a church in Corinth who was tolerating a man who was having inappropriate relations with his father's wife. They were boasting in this. Paul says you're boasting in this, but you should mourn. You should be upset. You should get this man out of the church because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin in the church ruins everything. And so we need children of God to get rid of the problem. If there is sin in this local church, we need to get it out of this local church. If there is sin in our lives, we need to get that sin out of our lives. If we have people in our lives who are causing us to sin, we need to get those people out of our lives. If we have objects in our lives that are causing us to sin, we need to get those objects out out of our lives. We need to do what it takes to get rid of the problem. Jesus was another example of one who got rid of the problem. Yesterday we talked about how Jesus went into the temple and he saw that the Jewish religious leaders had turned the place of God into a place of business. Christ flips over the tables, he pours out the coins, he makes a whip, and he drives the people out. He got rid of the problem. And that is exactly what we must do as we live in this world that is plagued by sin. This is how we must behave. This is how we must think. This is how we must act while the Lord has blessed us with time. This morning, we're talking about what it takes to stand in the gap. 
It takes all men and all women who bear the name of Christ to stand up and to be bold and to be courageous and to have so much love in their hearts for their fellow man who has fallen that we're willing to call out sin, that we're willing to pray and fast, and that we are willing to get rid of the problem. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. We praise you, we glorify you, and we magnify your wonderful name. We're so thankful for your word and the simplicity of it. We're thankful for the example that Moses shows us of what it takes to, to persuade you to give us some more time. We pray that we will be courageous and bold and faithful as Moses was. We pray that when we see sin in our own lives and in the lives of others, that we recognize it and that we call it out. We pray that we will always be people of prayer. We pray that we will pray for our own sins as well as the sins of others. And we pray that we will do whatever it takes to get sin out of our lives and do whatever it takes to get sin out of the lives of those who we love. We're so thankful for Jesus and the example that he has left us, the sacrifice that he made, which makes all things possible. We pray that we will live our lives in holy adoration to you and to your son, to the spirit. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.